Hi everyone. We are once again reading from Much Ado About Nothing by William Shakespeare. And we're going to go down the line and introduce ourselves and the many parts that we will each be playing because we are all forced to play several roles because we don't have so many of us. By the way, if you would like to read Shakespeare, feel free to contact me on Google+. My name is M space Monica, and we would be so delighted to have you read Shakespeare with us. We don't bite, and it would just be a fun experience for everyone. <laughs> well, Alex does. <laughs> so let's start with Alex. Alex. Sure. Alex Grossman here, and uh, I will be reading this evening uh, the parts of Leonato and The Watchman. Uh, I'm Glenn Rogers. I'll be reading the parts of Benedict and Dogberry. Hi, I'm Kia Kiali. I'll be reading the parts of Hero and Verges tonight. And, and hello again. I am M. Monica. I will be, or just Monica. Um, everybody always asks me that, so you can always call me Monica. Um, I will be reading the parts of Ursula, Claudio, Messenger, and Conrad. And I'm Nathan, and I will be reading the parts of Horatio, Don Pedro, and Margaret. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'll be reading the parts of Beatrix and Don John. All right, then. Let's do it. Good, Margaret. Run thee to the parlor. There shalt thou find my cousin Beatrice, proposing with the prince and Claudio. Whisper her ear and tell her, I and Ursula walk in the orchard, and our whole discourse is all of her. Say that thou overheardst us, and bid her still into the pleached bower, where honeysuckles, ripened by the sun, forbid the sun to enter like favorites, made proud by princes that advance their pride, against that power that bred it. There will she hide her, to listen our purpose. This is thy office. Bear thee well in it, and leave us alone. I'll make her come, I warrant you, presently. Now, Ursula, when Beatrice doth come, as we do trace this alley up and down, our talk must only be of Benedict. When I do name him, let it be thy part, to praise him more than ever man did merit. My talk to thee must be of how Benedict is sick in love with Beatrice. Of this matter is little Cupid's crafty arrow made, that only wounds by hearsay. Now begin, for look where Beatrice, like the lapwing, runs, close by the ground, to hear our conference. The pleasantest angling is to see the fish cut with her golden oars the silver stream, and greedily devour the treacherous bait. So angle we for Beatrice, who even now is couched in the woodbine coverture. Fear you not my part of the dialogue. Then go we near her, that her ear lose nothing of the false sweet bait that we lay for it. No, truly, Ursula, she is too disdainful. I know her spirits are as coy and wild as haggards of the rock. But are you sure that Benedict loves Beatrice so entirely? So says the prince and my new troth lord. And did they bid you tell her of it, madam? They did entreat me to acquaint her of it, but I persuaded them, if they loved Benedict, to wish him wrestle with affection, and never to let Beatrice know of it. Why did you so? Doth not the gentleman deserve as full fortunate a bed as ever Beatrice shall couch upon? O oh, God of love, I know he doth deserve as much as may be yielded to a man. But nature never framed a woman's heart of prouder stuff than that of Beatrice. Disdain and scorn write sparkling in her eyes, misprising what they look on, and her wit values itself so highly that to her all matter else seems weak. She cannot love, nor take no shape, nor project of affection. She is so self-endeared. Sure, I think so, and therefore certainly it were not good she knew his love, lest she make sport of it. Why, you speak truth. I never yet saw man, how wise, how noble, young, how rarely featured, but she would spell him backward. If fair-faced, she would swear the gentleman should be her sister. If black, why nature drawing of an antique made a foul blot. If tall, a lance ill-headed. If low, an agate very vilely cut. If speaking, why a vein blown with all winds. If silent, why a blocked, moved with none. 
So turns she every man the wrong side out, and never gives to truth and virtue that which simpleness and merit purchase. Sure, sure, such carping is not commendable. No, not to be so odd and from all fashion as Beatrice is, cannot be commendable. But who dare, dare tell her so? If I should speak, she would mock me into air. Oh, she would laugh me out of myself, press me to death with wit. Therefore, let Benedict, like covered fire, consume away in size, waste inwardly. It were a better death than die with mocks, which is as bad as die with tickling. Yet tell her of it. Hear what she will say. No, rather I will go to Benedict and counsel him to fight against his passion. And truly, I'll devise some honest slanders to stain my cousin with. One doth not know how much an ill word may empoison liking. Oh, do not do your cousin such a wrong. She cannot be without true judgment, having so swift and excellent a wit as she is prized to have, as to refuse so rare a gentleman as Signor Benedict. He is the only man of Italy, always excepted my dear Claudio. I pray you, be not angry with me, madam. Speaking my fancy, Signor Benedict, for shape, for bearing, argument, and valor, goes foremost in report through Italy. Indeed, he hath an excellent good name. His excellence did earn it, ere he had it. When are you married, madam? Why, every day to-morrow. Come, go in, I'll show thee some attires, and have thy counsel, which is the best to furnish me to-morrow. She's limed, I warrant you. We have caught her, madam. If it prove so, then loving goes by haps. Some Cupid kills with arrows, some with traps. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell, and maiden pride, adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee, to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reporting thee. I do but stay till your marriage be consummate, and then go I toward Aragon. I'll bring you thither, my lord, if you'll vouchsafe me. Nay, that would be as great a soil in the new gloss of your marriage as to show a child his new coat and forbid him to wear it. I will only be bold with Benedict for his company, for from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot he is all mirth. He hath twice or thrice cut Cupid's bowstring, and the little hangman dare not shoot at him. He hath a heart as sound as a bell, and his tongue is the clapper. For what his heart thinks, his tongue speaks. Gallants, I am not as I have been. So say I, methinks you are sadder. I hope he be in love. Hang him, truant. There's no true drop of blood in him to be truly touched with love. If he be sad, he wants money. I have the toothache. Draw it. Hang it. You must hang it first, and draw it afterwards. What? Sigh for the toothache. Where is but a humor or a worm? Well, everyone can master grief, but he that has it. Yet say I, he is in love. There is no appearance of fancy in him, unless it be a fancy that he hath to strange disguises. As to be a Dutchman today, a Frenchman tomorrow, or in the shape of two countries at once, as a German from the waist downward, all slops, and a Spaniard from the hip upward, no doublet. Unless he have a fancy to this foolery, as it appears he hath, he is no fool for fancy, as you would have it appear he is. If he be not in love with some woman, there is no believing old signs. A brushes his hat, O oh mornings. What should that bode? Hath any man seen him at the barber's? No, but the barber's man hath been seen with him, and the old ornament of his cheek hath already stuffed tennis balls. Indeed, he looks younger than he did by the loss of a beard. Nay, he rubs himself with civet. Can you smell him out by that? That's as much to say, the sweet youth's in love. The greatest note of it is his melancholy. And when was he wont to wash his face? 
Yeah, or to paint himself, for the which I hear what they say of him. Nay, but his jesting spirit, which is now crept into a lute string and now governed by stops. Indeed, that tells a heavy tale for him. Conclude, conclude he is in love. Nay, but I know who loves him. That would I know too. I warrant one that knows him not. Yes, and his ill conditions, and in despite of all, dies for him. She shall be buried with her face upwards. Is this no charm for the toothache? Old Signor, walk aside with me. I have studied eight or nine wise words to speak to you, which these hobby horses must not hear. For my life, to break with him about Beatrice. Tis even so. Hero and Margaret have by this played their parts with Beatrice, and then the two bears will not bite, each bite one another when they meet. My lord and brother, God save you. Good den, brother. If your leisure served, I would speak with you. In private? If it please you, yet Cla Count Claudio may hear for what I would speak of concerns him. What's the matter? Uh, means your lordship to be married tomorrow? You know he does. I know not that when he knows what I know. If there be any impediment, I pray you discover it. You may think I love you not. Let that appear hereafter and aim better at me by that I now will manifest. For my brother, I think he holds you well, and in dearness of heart hath hoped to effect your ensuing marriage. Surely suit ill spent and labor ill bestowed. Why, what's the matter? I came hither to tell you, and circumstances shortened, for she has been too long a talking of. The lady is disloyal. Who? Hero? Even she. Leonato's hero. Your hero, every man's hero. Disloyal? The word is too good to paint out her wickedness. I could say she were worse. Think you of a worse title and I will fit her to it. Wonder not till further warned. Go but with me tonight. You shall see her chamber chamber window entered even the night before her wedding day. If you love her then, tomorrow wed her, but it would better fit your honor to change your mind. May this be so? I will not think it. If you dare not trust that you see, confess not that you know. If you will follow me, I will show you enough. And when you have seen more and heard more, proceed accordingly. If I see anything tonight, why I should not marry her tomorrow in the congregation where I should wed, there I will shame her. And as I would for thee to obtain her, I will join with thee to disgrace her. I will disparage her no further till you are my witnesses. Bear it coldly, but till midday, and let the issue show itself. O oh, day untowardly turned! O oh, mischief strangely thwarting! O oh, plague right well prevented, so you will say when you have seen the sequel. Are you good men and true? Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yea, or else it were pity, but they should suffer salvation, body and soul. Nay, that were a punishment too good for them if they should have any allegiance in them, being chosen for the prince's watch. We'll give them their charge, neighbor Dogberry. First, who think you the most alertless man to be constable? Hugh Uttercake, sir, or George Seacole, for they can write and read. Come hither, neighbor Seacole. God hath blessed you with a good name to be a well-favored man is the gift of fortune, but to write and read comes by nature. Both which, Master Constable? You have. I knew it would be your answer. Well, for your favor, sir, why give God things and make no boast of it, and for your writing and reading, let that appear where there is no need of such vanity. You are thought here to be the most senseless and fit man for the Constable of the Watch. Therefore bear you the lantern. This is your charge. You shall comprehend all vagrom men. You are to bid any man stand in the Prince's name. How if a will not stand? Why, then, take no note of him, but let him go, and presently call the rest of the watch together, and thank God you are rid of a knave. If he will not stand when he is bidden, he is none of the prince's subject. True, and they are to meddle with none but the prince's subjects. You should also make no noise in the streets, for, for the watch to babble and to talk is most tolerable and not to be endured. We will rather sleep than talk. We know what belongs to a watch. Well, you speak like an ancient and most quiet watchman, for I cannot see how sleeping should offend. Only have a care that your bills 
be not stolen. Well, you're to call at all the alehouses and bid those that are drunk and get them to bed. How if they will not? Why, then let them alone till they are sober. If they make you not then the better answer, you may say that they are not the men you took them for. Well, sir? If you meet a thief, you may suspect him, by virtue of your office, to be no true man. And for such king of men, the less you meddle or make with them, why, the more is for your honesty. If we know him to be a thief, shall we not lay hands on him? Truly, by your office, you may. But I think that touch pitch will be defiled. The most peaceable way for you, if you do take a thief, is to let him show himself what he is and steal out of your company. You have been always called a merciful man, partner. Truly, I would not hang a dog by my will, much more a man who hath any honesty in him. If you hear a child cry in the night, you must call to the nurse and bid her still it. How if the nurse be asleep and will not hear us? Why, then, depart in peace, and let the child wake her with crying. For the ewe that will not hear her lamb when it bays will never answer a calf when he bleeps. Tis very true. This is the end of their charge. You, constable, are to present the prince's own person. If you meet the prince in the night, you may stay him. Nay, by our lady, that I can't think I cannot. Five shillings to one aunt, with any man that shows the statutes, he may stay him. Marry, not without the prince be willing, for indeed, the watch ought to offend no man. And it is an offense to stay a man against his will. Our lady, I think it be so. Ha, 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 Well, master's good night. And there be any matter of weight chances. Call up me. Keep your fellows' counsels and your own. And good night. I'm neighbor. Well, masters, we hear our charge. Let us go sit here upon the church bench till two, and then all to bed. One more, more honest neighbors. I pray you watch about Signor Leonardo's door, for the wedding being there tomorrow, there is a great coil tonight. Adieu. Be vigilant, I beseech you. What to Conrad? Peace, stir not. Conrad, I say. Here, man, I am at thy elbow. Mass, and my elbow itched. I thought there would be a scab follow. I will owe thee an answer for that. And now forward with thy tail. Stand thee close, then, under this penthouse, for it drizzles rain, and I will, like a true drunkard, utter all to thee. Some treason, masters, yet stand close. Therefore, therefore know I have earned of Don John a thousand ducats. Is it possible that any villainy should be so dear? Thou shouldst rather ask if it were possible any villainy should be so rich. For when rich villains have need of poor ones, poor ones may make what price they will. I wonder at it. That shows thou art unconfirmed. Thou knowest that the fashion of a doublet or a hat or a cloak is nothing to a man. Yes, it is apparel. I mean the fashion. Yes, the fashion is the fashion. Tush, I may as well say the fool's the fool. But seest thou not what a deformed thief this fashion is? I know that deformed. He has been a vile thief this seven year, who goes up and down like a gentleman. I remember his name. Didst thou not hear somebody? No, twas the vein on the house. Seest thou not, I say, what a deformed thief this fashion is? How giddily it turns about all the hot bloods between fourteen and five and thirty, sometimes fashioning them like Pharaoh's soldiers in the reeky painting, sometimes like God bells priests in the old church window. Sometimes like the shaven Hercules in the smirched, worm-eaten tapestry, where his codpiece seems as massy as his club. All this I see, and I see that the fashion wears out more apparel than the man. But art not thou thyself giddy with the fashion too, that thou hast shifted out of thy tale into telling me of the fashion? Not so, neither. But know that I have tonight wooed Margaret, the Lady Hero's gentlewoman by the name of Hero. She leans me out at her mistress' chamber window, bids me a thousand times good night. I tell this tale vilely. I should first tell thee how the prince, Claudio, and my master, planted and placed and possessed by my master Don John, saw afar off in the orchard this amiable encounter. And thought they Margaret was hero? Two of them did, the prince and Claudio. But the devil my master knew she was Margaret and partly by his oaths which first possessed them, partly by the dark night which did deceive them, 
but chiefly by my villainy, which did confirm any slander that Don John had made. Away went Claudio enraged, swore he would meet her as he was appointed next morning at the temple. And there, before the whole congregation, shame her with what he saw overnight and send her home again without a husband. We charge you in the prince's name, stand. Call up the right master constable. We have here recovered the most dangerous piece of lechery that ever was known in the Commonwealth. And one deformed is one of them. I know him. A oh, where's a lock? Masters, masters. You'll be made bring deformed forth, I warrant you. Masters. Never speak. We charge you, let us obey you to go with us. We are like to prove a goodly commodity being taken up of these men's bills. A commodity in question, I warrant you. Come, we'll obey you. Good Ursula, wake my cousin Beatrice and desire her to rise. I will, lady. And bid her come hither. Well. Troth, I think your other rabato were better. No, pray thee, good Meg, I'll wear this. But my troth's not so good, and I warrant your cousin will say so. My cousin's a fool, and thou art another. I'll wear none but this. I like the new tire within excellently. If the hair were a thought browner, and your gown's a most rare fashion in faith. I saw the Duchess of Milan's gown that they praise so. Oh, that exceeds, they say. By my troth, it's but a nightgown in respect of yours. Cloth of gold and cuts and laced with silver, set with pearls, down sleeves, side sleeves and skirts, round underborn with a bluish tinsel. But for a fine, quaint, graceful and excellent fashion, yours is worth ten on it. God give me joy to wear it, for my heart is exceeding heavy. It will be heavier soon by the weight of a man. Fie upon thee, art not ashamed. Of what, lady? Of speaking honorably. Is not marriage honorable in a beggar? Is not your lord honorable without marriage? I think you would have me say, saving your reverence, a husband, and bad thinking do not rest true speaking, I'll offend nobody. Is there any harm in the heavier for a husband? None, I think. And it be the right husband and the right wife. Otherwise, tis light and not heavy. Ask my lady Beatrice else. Here she comes. Good morrow, cuz. Good morrow, sweet hero. Why, how now do you speak in the sick tune? I am out of all other tune, methinks. Claps into light a love. That goes without a burden. Do you sing it, and I'll dance it. Ye light o' love with your heels. Then, if your husband have stables enough, you'll see she shall lack no burns. Oh, illegitimate construction. I scorn that with my heels. Tis almost five o'clock, cousin. Tis time you're ready. By my troth, I'm exceeding ill. Hey ho. For a hawk, a horse, or a husband? For the letter that begins them all, H. Well, and you be not turned Turk, there's no more sailing by the star. What means the fool, Trow? Nothing I, but God send everyone their heart's desire. These gloves the Count sent me, they are an excellent perfume. I am stuffed, cousin, I cannot smell. A maid and stuffed, there's goodly catching of cold. Oh, God help me, God help me, how long have you professed apprehension? Even since you left it. Doth not my wit become me rarely? It is not seen enough. You should wear it in your cap. By my troth, I am sick. Get you some of this disskilled carduous benedictus, and lay it to your heart. It is the only thing for a qualm. There thou prickest her with a thistle. Benedictus? Why, Benedictus? You have some moral in this, Benedictus. Moral? No, by my troth, I have no moral meaning. I meant plain holy thistle. You may think, perchance, that I think you are in love. Nay, by our lady, I am not such a fool to think what I list, nor I list not to think what I can, nor indeed I cannot think. If I would think my heart out of thinking that you are in love, or that you will be in love, or that you can be in love, yet Benedict was such another, and now is he become a man, he swore he would never marry, and yet now, in despite of his heart, he eats his meat without grudging, and how you may be converted I know not, but methinks you look with your eyes as other women do. What pace is this that thy tongue keeps? Not a false gallop. Madam, withdraw. The prince, the count, Signor Benedict, 
Don John and all the gallants of the town are come to fetch you to church. Help to dress me, good cause, good Meg, good Ursula. What would you with me, honest neighbor? Mary, sir, I would have some confidence with you that discerns you nearly. Brief, I pray you, for you see it is a busy time with me. Mary, this it is, sir. Yes, in truth it is, sir. What is it, my good friends? Good man, Virgis, sir, peek a little of the man, an old man, sir, and his wits are not so blunt as, God help, I would deserve they were, but in fact, honest as the skin between his brows. Yes, I thank God I am as honest as any man living that is an old man, and no honester than I. Comparisons are odorous, palabras, neighbor, Virgis. Neighbors, you are tedious. It pleases your worship to say so, but we are the poor duke's officers. But truly, for mine own part, if I were as tedious as a king, I could find it in my heart to bestow it in all of your worship. All thy tediousness on me? Yea, and to a thousand pound more than this. For as I hear as good exclamation on your worship as of any man in the city, and though I be but a poor man, I am glad to hear it. And so am I. I would fain know what you have to say. Mary, sir, our watch tonight, excepting your worship's present, hadn't taken a couple as an errant knaves as any in Messina. A good old man, sir, he will be talking, as they say, when the age is in, the wit is out. God help us, it is a world to see, well said I of faith, neighbor virgins. God's a good man, and two men ride of a horse, one must ride behind. Uh, an honest soul in faith, sir, by my troth, he is, as ever broke bread. But God is to be worshipped, all men are not alike, alas, good neighbor. Indeed, neighbor, he comes too short of you. Gifts that God gives. I must leave you. One word, sir. Our watch, sir, have indeed comprehended two auspicious persons, and we would have them this morning examined before your worship. Take their examination yourself and bring it to me. I am now in great haste, as it may appear unto you. It shall be sufficient. Drink some wine ere you go. Fare you well. My lord, they say for you to give your daughter to her husband. I'll wait upon them. I am ready. Go, good partner, go. Get you to Francis C. Cole. Bid him bring his pin and inkhorn to the gallop. We are now to examination these men. And we must do it wisely. We will spare for no wit, I warrant you. Here is that shall drive some of them to a non -com. Only get the learned rider to get down our excommunication and meet me at the gallery. And that is the end yeah. of the act. It went pretty smooth. Yeah. yeah, thank you everybody for participating. And we will be recording uh, Act 5. Act four next Act week. Four. Yay. Sure, but I'd like to just um, say that it'll be next week, Wednesday, at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if you are interested in joining. Oh, the date next Wednesday. The 16th. The 16th. Yeah, today's the 8th, so yeah. Wednesday's better than Thursday for me. Glenn, you have a really good Shakespearean voice. Yes. Oh, you, thank you. You do have a really good Shakespearean voice. You, were like, you, were, you definitely could like be paid to do this stuff. So would anyone like to plug a website? <laughs> Checks in the mail, you're supposed sure. to. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go ahead and bring up... Uh, MediaTapper.com, which is a uh, social media magazine. Uh, feel free to uh, check it out, and you'll find lots of interesting articles uh, about how to use and uh, uh, how to uh, get the most out of social media online. Cool. Uh, I have a blog called Game View Fake Gaming News Print to Fit. And I also just published an ebook called Selected Items from the Newsosphere. And uh, I also do a movie riff on Google Plus. And thanks to Google, we've got new pages for both of those. So check them out. I can be found at Kiakiali Monteverde on Google Plus. Well, that's two. <laughs> and 
<laughs> my website, I'm located on a very small website. It's very hard to find, but it's called Google Plus. <laughs> you may have heard of it. I don't know. Anyway, Nathan also. That start thing. <laughs> I uh, run a blog dedicated to bird sounds at earbirding.com. Um, I would I would say the media tappers thing, same as Alex says. I'm a contributor to uh, media tapper. I usually write an article a week. Um, in December, I will be doing I will be starting a movie review column, and so that will uh, have a lot to to do with uh, will help out movie riff and everything too. And then on Monday night, I have a um, a trivia hangout every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and also, and also I'm on Google Plus, so you can't miss me. I have like everybody in the world following me. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. And her name is Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, I know. There you go. 